Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Rev Left Radio. Today, we have a very important episode um, on today that we really wanted to to share with people. And it's, it's an issue that has been going on for quite some time, doesn't get as much coverage as it should. Um, and that is the issue of what's going on in the Congo, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, specifically in the eastern Congo, um, around the cobalt mines and, and other uh, natural resources and mineral mines, um, the, the role that U.S. imperialism plays with the Comprador regimes in Rwanda and Uganda and how they work together to destabilize um, and brutalize uh, the, the Congolese people and, and the Congo in general. Um, this is a really important conversation, and I really hope people listen to it. We have two wonderful guests from the organization Friends of the Congo. We have uh, Maurice from that organization, and we also have Passy, who is actually grew up and is in, as we speak to him in this interview, is in um, Kinshasa, the capital of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So we get uh, Passy's sort of on-the-ground organizer uh, perspective of the issue, and we get Maurice's deep um, knowledge of the history of, of the area and the role that U.S. imperialism and Western neocolonialism plays. And so throughout this conversation, it's just a really wonderful um, patchwork of perspectives that help us understand what's going on. And importantly, uh, the most important thing is, of course, how we can help. And at the very end, I asked that question. They both answer it. Um, but one of the main answers is going to freecongo.org. There you can donate uh, money to the cause to help the people who are being Um, brutalized uh, by these rebel groups, by M23, etc. You can sign a petition that they ask you to sign, and you can even connect and join up uh, with the organization Friends of the Congo uh, to help them in a more concrete and ongoing fashion. I highly, highly encourage people to do that. Uh, It's an incredibly important issue. And, And what comes out in this conversation, we make very clear towards the end, is this fight for this fight against climate change and this fight for a better future, uh, a future less relying on fossil fuels, is often presented to us as this, you know, holy good thing. We can transition uh, to you know electric vehicles and to you know um, solar panels and move away from fossil fuels. But but just like everything with liberalism, the 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 thing that they present you with hides a rotting core. And underneath that core of this quote-unquote green capitalist transition is a mountain of workers at the bottom of that supply chain being brutalized, living in in, in conditions that are modern-day slavery conditions, um, are being displaced from their land, are being brutalized, uh, having atrocities committed against them, etc. Because there's deep, deep financial interests around the world, um, but specifically being led by, by the West and the U.S., to have access to these minerals at lo- as at as low a cost as possible, and that comes with the brutalization of human beings. And so, when we want to speak up about climate change, when we want to speak up about the necessity to move to new forms of renewable energy, we have to center the fight of the working and poor people who make it all possible. And the people of the Congolese, the Congolese people, the people of the Congo, um, are absolutely crucial to that entire process and are being treated in deeply inhumane ways. And as we discuss in this episode, that inhumane treatment at the hands of of the West and of European colonialists and neocolonialists goes way, way back. Some of the most brutal um, atrocities of the 20th century um, came with the Belgian Congo under King Leopold II. And um, we talk about that in this episode as well. And I don't want to obviously dig into the graphic details, but you can look it up and just see how disgustingly brutal that regime was and we and now we have the numbers of 10 million Congolese people during that period of Belgian colonialism in the Congo being murdered 10 million um, that is a, a, a genocidal mass murder campaign to benefit financially this, this, the centers of imperialism and colonialism in Europe and in the West absolutely disgusting um, but we also of course talk about Patrice Lumumba right one of the heroes of the Congo and one of the, the, the people who stood up and fought back against that colonialism and with the, with the masses by his side um, helped lead the, the liberation and independence um, struggle for those people. But still to this day, as we talk about in the episode, more explicit, brutal colonialism of past centuries has been replaced with the more refined, sophisticated neocolonialism. But the same levels of exploitation and in many cases the same level of brutality continues to persist in these areas. And so our fight against climate destabilization is also and must always be 
a conscious fight against colonialism in all of its manifestations. And you can't fight capitalism, you can't fight imperialism, you can't fight fascism, and you can't fight climate change without fighting colonialism, which allowed for and ushered all the rest in. Um, so this is a really important conversation. And without further ado, here is my conversation with Passy and Maurice from Friends of the Congo. Enjoy. My name is Pasio Igozi, as known as Pasi Bass. I'm a musician, a bass player, I'm an educator, teacher, and youth organizer. I'm working with the organization uh, RAS, which is Réseau Afroculture, or that can be translated in English as Afroculture Network. This organization that is fighting for for the unity, for the, the awareness of the situations in, in Congo and uh, try to mobilize the masses. Uh, I've been working with Friends of the Congo since 2018 from Bukambu, South Kivu province of Congo, where I was born. And uh, here in Congo, I in Kinshasa. It's thanks to Friends of the Congo with their other organizations that I can here, I went in Ghana as well, and just to learn about Pan Africanism and socialism and the principles of communism. So I'm um, just here working just to mobilize the masses, but in arts production and in activism, going on the ground and also educating students about the history of Congo, especially uh, the struggle and the vision of Lumumba. Thank you. Hmm. Wonderful. Maurice, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, uh, my name is Maurice uh, Carney. I am uh, one of the co-founders of uh, Friends of the Congo. I also serve as the organization's executive uh, director. I've uh, been engaged in pan-African solidarity work uh, around uh, Congo and, and Africa for guys, uh, over, over a quarter century, uh, over 25, 30 years. Uh, been uh, engaged in in building uh, solidarity, uh, organizing an African solidarity uh, work uh, between uh, Africans, Africans at home, and uh, Africans uh, abroad. And looking forward to this discussion uh, today, Brett. Wonderful. Well, it's an honor and a pleasure to have both of you on today to talk about an incredibly important issue. Um, but first and foremost, I'd like to introduce your organization to our listeners. So can you please tell me about or tell us about Friends of the Congo, how it started, its sort of ideological orientation and, and what its main goals are? Sure, sure. Fr Friends of the Congo is a pan-African solidarity uh, institution. Uh, we've been in existence uh, for over 20 years uh, now. And uh, we come in the, in the tradition of uh, organizations like uh, the International Friends of uh, Abyssinia. Uh, for those of you who are, may or may not remember, uh, the Friends of Abyssinia uh, started by figures like uh, C.M.R. James, Amy Ashwood Garvey, uh, T.J. Mary Show, uh, Jomo Kenyatta, and these are Africans who rallied uh, to come to the side of uh, Ethiopia when Ethiopia was under attack uh, by the Italians in the uh, 19, 19, late 1930s. And uh, by the same token, today, Friends of the Congo uh, organize and rally to come uh, by the side of uh, Congolese. Well, they're, uh, they've been under attack uh, for the past quarter century uh, by proxy forces of the, the United States and the United Kingdom uh, that has triggered the a uh, tremendous loss of uh, life of millions of Congolese that uh, perish as a result of this war of aggression against them. And so Friends of the Congo uh, organized uh, to do with really two mandates. Uh, one is to raise global consciousness about what was transpiring in the Congo. So we had a situ situation where millions of people have perished and there wasn't much attention being focused on it. Uh, so that was one of our key aims is to uh, let the world know what was taking place in the Congo. And the second uh, is to provide support to local institutions, 
those that are engaged in those that are engaged in uh, striving for long lasting change in the Congo. Wonderful. Well, it's 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 a wonderful what your organization is doing. Uh, we obviously support it here at Rev Left, and that's one of the reasons why we wanted to have you on. Um, the way that we're going to do this conversation is kind of do it in two parts. One, we're going to cover some of the basic history of the Congo, of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, we're going to talk about that history, some important points, Lumumba, etc. And then we'll transition into a discussion of what's happening um, in the area presently. So, you know, for the historical aspect of it, and I know, I know this is a big question, so feel free to take this in whatever direction you want. But can you kind of give us a brief historical overview of the Congo and sort of how it came to be what it is today? I suppose I could start and perhaps you can and chime in. Uh, what we usually share with, uh, with folks is that uh, Congo has been, the Congo itself, uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the Republic of Congo, the, the Congo has been... Uh, central to the 500-year tragedy of people of African ancestry. Uh, from the early 1500s to the late 1800s, and the trafficking of Africans uh, from the continent to the Americas, uh, almost half uh, of those trafficked, those Africans trafficked to the Americas, came out of the Congo region, the Congo Empire, the Central Africa region. Uh, according to Emory University's uh, database. So we see that that, that, that heart of Africa, uh, the region where Congo is located, looming large at the very outset of the extraction of uh, resources, extraction of human beings from the, from the African continent. And we uh, moved to the 1800s, where the late 1800s, 1880. For 1885, uh, the Berlin Conference, uh, it was also called the Congo Conference. And Congo also figured uh, large in that conference as well, in that Congo was uh, given to King Leopold II of Belgium as his own personal property coming out of uh, the Berlin Conference, uh, where he reigned over uh, the so-called Congo Free State that that they created, the Europeans created it, uh, coming out of the Berlin Conference for a 23-year period, 1885 to 1908, where uh, an estimated 10 million people perished as the king extracted rubber and ivory. Yeah, Passy, would you like to add anything to, to that? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Brother Maurice, for this wonderful presentation. Log, uh, you have just said, you know, Everything started from the Berlin Conference in 1885. And uh, up to the time, uh, well, Lumumba and the Kasavu took power. And this was the first republic. The second republic uh, is when the, the name of the country moved from Congo up to Zai. And I would like to, to analyze it, to give uh, the, the details on the, the word Congo. Congo comes from the Kikongo language, local, local language. Ko is a prefix which means a, an ally, someone who is like, is connected to. And Ngo means leopard, okay? So like uh, the, this wild, wild cat. And it means that Congo uh, symbolizes authority. So before the arrival of Europeans, these colonizers, we, we were organized in terms of empires and kingdoms, local kingdoms. And uh, after this era, the period of the Second Republic, uh, which was led by Mobutu, who moved on to the, uh, the democracy. So Congo became the Democratic Republic okay, of Congo. And uh, so far, this is, this is the, the third, let's say, the third uh, republic that we are we are. We undergo, we are living. So this is the, the, the short history of, of Congo in, in terms of the history, and also the, the origin of the concept of Congo. And uh, we have been uh, undergoing so, so many atrocities from their, the, the rubber up to the cobalt, the copper, uraniums, and you know the history of uh, Japan and, and USA. So we are victims of our... Uh, richness and wealth, and uh, that's why Lumumba died. So that's what I can say in brief. And we, as heirs of Lumumba, 
we are there to continue the struggle against exploitation and to give Congo its value. Thank you. Mm. Absolutely. Beautifully said. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that that history of, of European colonialism and a particularly disgusting chapter in the broader disgusting history of European colonialism was what was called, and you mentioned it, the Belgian Congo. Uh, during this time, Leopold II oversaw some of the most brutal, inhumane treatment of African people in the Congo in particular. Can you tell us a little bit about this uh, tragic history so people can understand uh, that history of trauma that people in the area have gone through? Yeah, thank you. In order to to build and to, to come up, come up with the products from rubber, they exploited uh, as imperialism and capitalism is defined as exploitation of humans by humans. So the the leopard era, mean domination regime, was there just to exploit to consider Congolese as subhumans, and we are we are undergoing these tactics. And these strategies of, of of imperialism, they are now they are not calling themselves colonialists, but they are new colonialists because they are changing strategies. Instead of using people to exploit, to extract uh, rubber, now it's uh, about other minerals because the context is changing. And people now need cobalt; they need co- cotton to to have more um, more products or uh, materials and. And from the industry, so we are we are having the same context. And the question is that why Lumumba? If Lumumba was there, what could Lumumba do? Because they they are trying the multiple strategies just to to make us sleep, not to awaken ourselves. They they are using the government, and we are we have betrayers. So we have so many betrayers, and we are trying to. To make puppets of the power, and because they are not intervening directly, they are using NGOs, association organizations, and uh, they are using rebels movements. You know these move, movements that I call anti Pan Africanist movements. They are using neighboring countries. They are using now these people who will will work with the governments. They are having some agreements, and this is the strategy, and that's why Lumumba in other nationalities, these uh, fighters of freedom died. It is the, sa- the same context. You're cutting the, the hands, the arms of the population, the local population, just to extract a uh, rubber. They're using their hands, and the more hand, I mean, the more rubber you bring, the, I mean, the, the more uh, something, you know, response and encouragement you have. If you don't bring cu- a rubber, you have to cut your hands. And today, if we, we are not producing uh, these uh, minerals, we are not giving them minerals. They, they just come and rape and just kill us and using uh, these rebels, using other strategies just to maintain us in this, in this uh, exploitation, this oppression. I think that it is the same, the same process, the same strategy about changing the forms. Thank you. Yeah, Maurice, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, it's uh, the... The, the the atrocity that were committed under under King Leopold uh, were uh, it's kind of interesting uh, because you know friends of the Congo uh, we uh, established a rate consciousness about what's transpiring in the Congo that doesn't also that doesn't deal solely with the contemporary Congo it also deals with historic Congo because during that twenty three year period that King Leopold reigned. Uh, the population was decimated by half. Right? An estimated 10 million Congolese perished as the king extracted that uh, rubber and the, and the ivory. But people uh, already know about it. People know about the, the Holocaust. People may know about the Armenian genocide. Uh, but uh, folks didn't really, weren't really present uh, to what had transpired uh, in the Congo under King Leopold II. And interestingly enough, uh, the atrocities, uh, many of the atrocities that were committed by the king was documented by an African-American by the name of William Shepard. Uh, and he produced uh, the, uh, the reports of uh, the hands being chopped off and, and the killings and the lashings and the forced labor and virtual slavery that people experienced during the king, uh, king's reign, which prompted figures like uh, Mark Twain, you know, who wrote King Leopold's soliloquy. Uh, exposing the atrocious 
uh, conditions in the Congo under the king, uh, who said that he's going into the Congo to bring Christianity and to bring civilization and to end slavery. And he uh, uh, did the opposite. He, he, he destroyed civilization in the, uh, in the Congo. And you had figures like Booker T. Washington, uh, who uh, uh, wrote uh, uh, essays uh, around uh, the tragedy that was uh, being committed. Um, so what, what it did, uh, on the one hand, it uh, uh, laid bare the tragedy that was uh, taking place in the, in the Congo that period, but it also spurred on an international movement uh, with figures like Booker T. Washington, a uh, great African-American figure like George Washington Williams, who participated, uh, who was a part of the civil war in the U.S., and went to the Congo in the 1890s and said what was happening there were, were basically crimes against humanity. Um, so uh, there, uh, and in addition to that, you had Congolese. I don't want to leave the, without sharing that were resisting. Whole communities, the villages resisted the, the king's uh, imposition. Uh, and many of those communities um, today will tell those stories of uh, how their ancestors resisted uh, the, the brutal reign of King Leopold the second of Belgium in the Congo. Mm. Yeah, it's it's absolutely atrocious. You said ten million um, Congolese uh, murdered under that under that brutal brutal regime. And of course, the the lie of European colonialism is always this this in, in, insane idea that they're bringing civilization when they actually bring the exact con you know the exact contrary of civilization. They bring barbarism, anti human cruelty, and they did destroy existing and flourishing civilizations. We see the same dynamic going on right now um, in historic Palestine where Israel is 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 using a lot of the same language that European colonialists have used for hundreds and hundreds of years about bringing civilization and being the only democracy in the Middle East while they yeah. absolutely brutalize Palestinians. Um, so, and we must we must never forget that that what comes along, you know, with a, with a settler colonialism, with a, with the enslavement, with the exploitation, is the propaganda, mm -hmm. right? Civilization, Christianity, democracy, uh, all of those uh, words that cover uh, the cruel and inhumane treatment that's being perpetrated against indigenous populations, uh, and unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, and we'll get to this later. Uh, that 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 propaganda has stuck when it comes to Africa overall, quote unquote, the dark continent, Congo in particular, quote unquote, the heart of darkness. So what that does is it numbs people's mind, minds as to what is happening, because when they see what's happening in the Congo and Africa, they say, oh, that's always happened. You know, these are, as Fassi said, uh, uh, bestial folks. They're less than human. Uh, there's always been conflict, and there will always be conflict. So this this uh, this narrative of the pejorative narrative of this uh, backward African, this less than human African, helps to uh, cover uh, the the crimes that are being committed against uh, uh, Congolese and and uh, and other Africans. So that's an important component of the. Uh, destruction of these communities uh, in the Congo and Africa writ large. Yeah, uh, that that propaganda that uh, that goes with it. Very well said. But with with that oppression, with that brutality, also comes the African people standing up, defending themselves, and fighting back. Um, either the masses themselves, or you know, even these these historic leaders that we look back on with a lot of praise. And one of those leaders is somebody that has been mentioned a couple times already in this conversation, which is the great revolutionary uh, Patrice Lumumba. Can you tell us a little bit more about who Lumumba was, what he contributed to the Congolese masses and their struggle for self determination, and what his legacy? is in the country and on the continent as a whole to this day? For me, Lumumba was a young man, and I think today I have the same age uh, of Lumumba. And he was just someone who was conscious, and he was, and, and they, they used to call him someone who was rude, because the situation that we're living here brings, you know, uh, incites in ourselves a kind of anger. And uh, if you're not part of this, this anger, it means that you, you're just naive, you're indifferent. And I think Lumumba uh, was this, uh, this leader, the, I mean, the, the dreamers, he was the visionary. He had a vision of, of change. So he was seeing Congo in another level of uh, freedom and, and self-determination uh, uh, self and self 
a sufficient thing. And that's what we remember was he was someone uh, who was like a motor, a small motor that's good and uh, just to start a, a big motor, which is a, a the population is the the person who uh, who gave us the the envy so far, because uh, ideologically speaking, Mumba is not dead, and uh, for us we we need to understand his vision, because here in Congo, Mumba is not known, not only understood, but is not known. That's why, uh, with the support of Friend of the Congo, our organization. Uh, Ras, a race is trying to to sensitize, to teach the masses about the, the speeches of Lumumba. It, it's worthwhile noting that Lumumba was not working as a nationalist. He was supported by an African and pan African leaders like Kwame Nkrumah, and uh, this why these uh, Belgians and these, let's say, these international forces couldn't. Let, let him just exploit and I mean practice his vision, his strategies, his plan for the Congo. People do not know that Lumumba had an economic plan of the Congo, and uh, that was not known. He started talking about the economic aspects of Congo, and that's the beginning of the, the, the attack and the threat to, to make him kill. And let's talk about the in heritage of uh, Lumumba. So we, young Congolese, we try to continue the struggle of Mumba by understanding his words. Because we, we always say that people and need to include, include his, his vision uh, in, in the constitution of, of Congo. They shouldn't make them like laws. Because people always claim that Lumumba did not, uh, was in a hurry to, 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 to ask the independence. He could wait for some more years. And I said, no, you are not living in the context of Lumumba at that time. Mm. It, it is like today. People who are not interested in what is happening in, in, in Eastern Congo, and they, they, they think that this is another country. For example, here in Kinshasa, some people say that, no, the problem of, of Eastern Congo, the armed conflict in Eastern Congo does not interest us. It's about another part of the country. So... For us, Lumumba is someone who could see Congo in all angles. You know, no matter how his tribe, he couldn't uh, care about his tribe. But today you are seeing people who are leading their cyber, being based on their tribal and their ethnic origins. And so Lumumba was someone who could unite Congo. We have more tribes and he could see the future of the whole country, not only from his background, from the Batetela tribe. But you could you could see that his political parts could involve okay, could involve all these uh, corners of the country, so north, south, eastern, and western part of the country, which was different from um, uh, the president, the former president, the first president of yeah, of Congo, someone who could say that Abako is the association of one tribe called the Bakongo. So this is different from. From Lumba, who could see the future of the country by trying to mobilize, he was a popular leader because he could read and try to report uh, the revolutionary messages, strategies from uh, people like Gandhi. When he met people like Kwame Nkrumah, he could understand the future of this country and uh, the impact of DRC uh, as a global, uh, as a global, uh, I mean, uh, country. Like uh, Francois Nou said that. We are the trigger. And I think if we use the forces, the, the materials that Congo has got today, we can change whole half. And this has been proven. Uh, and this has been uh, analyzed and, and confirmed. That's what I, I may say about Mumba. Yeah, v very important stuff there and, and very well said. And, and like you said, instead of being like the previous president, um, merely a, a sort of tribal leader or representing one faction of the Congolese people, um, figures like Patrice Lumumba sought to unite the entire country, the all the, the unite the people of the Congo as well as the people of Africa. Kwame Nkrumah, Thomas Sankara. There's a long line of other African leaders um, in that same revolutionary tradition as well, which is which is absolutely gorgeous and beautiful. And for those interested, we we did recently an episode on Kwame Nkrumah with uh, two members from the Black Alliance for Peace. So if anybody listening 
listening wants to learn more about uh, Kwame Nkrumah and what went on in Ghana and the connections with Lumumba, definitely check that episode out. Before we move on to the present, though, uh, Maurice, did you have anything you wanted to add to that question about Lumumba or anything else about history before we move into the present? I'm so, I'm so, yes, yes. I'm so glad that Passy intervened the way he did by sharing how young Congolese uh, are embracing uh, the visions and the ideas and the teachings of Lumumba, uh, which lets us know uh, unequivocally uh, and that uh, Lumumba lives. You know, that that uh, our upholding Lumumba is of value uh, and importance to this generation, not of con- solely of Congolese, but of, uh, of young young Africans. Uh, just from the outset, I wanted to, to just a few things to, to complement what uh, what Patsy said, uh, based on what what Patsy shared uh, about Lumumba being uh, uh, con- being concerned about uh, not only the future of Congo but the future of uh, of Africa, and uh, his uh, relationship with Kwame Nkrumah. Kwame Nkrumah wrote a book uh, entitled "The Challenge of the Congo," where he laid out how he and Lumumba had agreed that Congo would serve as the capital of the United States of Africa in Kwame Nkrumah's Pan-African vision. Mm. And this represented a tremendous uh, threat uh, to uh, the imperialists, to the colonialists, uh, which explains uh, in part why the uh, Central Intelligence Agency, uh, uh, the United States, led by its Central Intelligence Agency, mounted the largest covert action in the world at the time, the 1960s, to overthrow and ultimately assassinate um, Patrice Lumumba. Uh, Larry Devlin, in his uh, in his book uh, *Chief of State in Congo*, said that uh, they had to overthrow uh, Lumumba. If he was, uh, if they didn't overthrow Lumumba, uh, then uh, not only would the West have lost uh, Congo, they would have lost all of Africa. So he centers uh, Congo in the future of uh, the African continent, and in his book, he he lays out uh, the play playbook for overthrowing democratically elected leaders, uh, just as uh, the U.S. did at Mossadegh. In Iran, uh, Allende uh, later in uh, in Chile, uh, uh, Guatemala as well, uh, overthrowing uh, their elected uh, uh, leader. I think it was Arbenz, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so Lumumba fit in those uh, leaders from the global south mm. that have been targeted by the the Central Intelligence Agency and uh, uh, Sister Susan Williams in uh, in her book White Malice. Uh, does a, she said it was kind of interesting. She said, I wanted to, I started out writing about a book about Lumumba and Nkrumah. That's what I wanted to do because Lumumba was radicalized by Nkrumah coming out of the 1958 All African People's Conference. If you look at Lumumba pre 58 and post 1958, you see a different uh, Lumumba. Well, pre 58, more of a integrationist, wanting to get along. Post 58, after meeting Fanon and uh, uh, Toure and and certainly in Kuma at the, at the All African People's Conference, you find uh, a different Lumumba uh, arguing for a self determined Congo, self sufficient Congo, uh, a Congo that fits within the context of Africa, uh, Pan African Congo. Um, so uh, Susan Williams said that uh, she wanted to write this story about these two giants of, of leaders. But everywhere she turned, the CIA kept getting in the way. It just she she said I couldn't wherever I did the research, the CIA was there. So uh, I I had to go back to my. She said yeah, I had to go back to my, uh, you know, my collaborators and and share with them. We're like this is it's just they just keep getting in the way. And, and they said, well, just write about it. So that's how she came up with with White Malice, which uh, looks at the uh, uh, Nkuma and Lumumba certainly, uh, but the role of the CIA in thwarting Lumumba, overturning uh, the nascent democratic uh, institutions uh, or aspirations, rather, that were in the, in the Congo, just uh, uh, deracinating or whatever, uprooting whatever hopes or aspirations that the Congolese people would have uh, in the line of democracy and, and imposing uh, on the Congolese people a corrupt... Uh, 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 how can I say, self-serving elite, uh, exemplified by Joseph Desiree Mobutu, who, who the CIA uh, helped to in, to install. Uh, and in fact, uh, in the U.S. Uh, records, it's uh, declassified documents, that they, they, they state that in the first, uh, every leader that came to power in the first, in the first 10 years or so of the Congo's independence, uh, outside of Lumumba, there wasn't a decision that was made that 
uh, had to do with uh, with uh, the leadership and the power uh, being held by uh, Congolese that the CIA didn't have a hand in. Mm. Uh, and, and for all intents and purposes, since Lumumba, every leader that has risen to power in the Congo uh, has had to have uh, the stamp or the imprint, uh, the sign-off of the, of the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that external role, uh, the role that was played by the Central Intelligence Agency, by the United States government in cahoots with the United Nations in, in Belgium and the U.K., and uh, the psychopaths, uh, the, the local elite, uh, can, uh, must be told when we talk about uh, Lumumba and uh, why he was uh, uh, overthrown so quickly. Inaugurated on June 30th, 1960, assassinated on January 17th, 1961, less than seven months. They didn't give him any time because they knew how dangerous he was to their interests, how much of a threat he was to their interests. They had to get rid of him quickly. Mm. Uh, so, um, but what Bathy said that they may have gotten rid of the body, but the ideas, the teachings, the spirit live in uh, young people like Patty and countless others uh, in the Congo, which uh, which gives us a, a tremendous amount of hope for the future of the, the Congo and, and Africa overall. Yes, yes, and I, I highly encourage listeners to to get the the book White Malice. Um, you know, from from our perspective, as somebody who's born and raised here in the belly of the beast, you know, the CIA is the organized crime branch of the United States ruling class. It's the largest and most powerful terrorist organization on earth. And I hope one day its agency and its its uh, perpetuators within the agency face the justice that they so desperately need to face. Because what the CIA and the U.S. government has done around the world is a disgrace. It's disgusting. And as somebody who was born here, um, I, I just I'm eternally repulsed by how our government and its agencies have operated around the world. And to, for then the U.S. to turn around and try to tell the world that they're the number one defenders of freedom and democracy around the world is just nauseating. Um, but like Fred Hampton here in Chicago said, you can kill a revolutionary, but you can't kill a revolution. And so by killing these these uh, leaders of the African people, pan-African leaders, they have inspired um, continued generations. They've made martyrs out of these leaders, um, and, and their, their spirits and their legacies continue to live on and really offer the best hope for Africa as a whole uh, going forward uh, into the future. So I, I salute the, the, the fallen martyrs of, of Pan-Africanism. Absolutely. Now let, let's go ahead and, and move into the, the present state of things. Now that we have a, a fairly good grasp on, on some of the basic history involved, can you tell us what's sort of been happening lately in, in the Congo and, and what your organization is trying to do in light of, of recent events? Yeah, thank you. Not later than yesterday, uh, thanks to friend of the Congo and brother Maurice, and we now a rally, a demonstration, a peaceful demonstration uh, on the support Okay, um, and de denouncing uh, this occupation of the Bonagana city of Eastern Congo. So, uh, so far, uh, we we have reached 600 days. Okay, the country, I mean, the, that territory is being occupied by rebels supported by uh, by Rwanda and Uganda. So many atrocities they have been done to occupying and and with the participation, the support of some. Uh, unconscious Congolese, okay, who uh, attempt to claim for, I don't know, the integration in the army. So that's uh, the very uh, recent uh, information. And they are near Goma, Goma uh, town. They, they want to reach Goma and try to uh, to control the North Cave uh, province and, and even their South Cave province. And this is their, their recent uh, situation because... Security is very important. When there is no peace in the country, it is difficult to change, to develop in the, the country. So we, we as young leaders, we, we went there, we tried to denounce, tried to, to make a mass mobilization, so a mass a message to the population, tried to denounce, to remind. We went there in the General Assembly, the Congress, to let those MPs, those congressmen who are corrupt, they have uh, more salaries than the teachers who could tell the, the discussion, who could prepare the, these students, these children and students who will need to change the country. Uh, let me focus on this because these people, they, 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 they are corrupt by the government. These 
uh, politicians who give them money, they give them some cars just to to make laws for their, uh, I mean, their, their authorities, their government, they are maintaining in power, but they are not fighting, they are not denouncing what is happening. Because security, the Eastern Congo, which is the most and the richest part of the country, is uh, very, very important, is uh, crucial, and is uh, very, very capital of the, the development of the country. So the more that that fund will be in, uh, in, in security, uh, less the develop, development of the country will, will come. That's why you can see after the elections, uh, the president was being declared, okay, the winner, okay, he won the elections. We know how these elections uh, will open us. And now they are, not, they are doing nothing. Of course, it, it is good to support uh, activities uh, like uh, sports. And they are, they are more interested in sports rather than uh, denouncing, the, rather than fighting back uh, these rebels. Make sure that these rebels, they, they had some agreements. They, they, they had some collaboration before uh, launching, before going on the, and, uh, the front line. They, they had some meetings here in Kinshasa. And these rebels, the M23, uh, the rebels and and movement. They had some contract. They know what they are fighting for. And they, they have some agreements in collaboration. They have, they know how they, they, they work with the government. The problem is that we, young people, we need to have spaces. And that's why the organization, we are trying to mobilize the masses. And this month, we will try to reach uh, these uh, social groups of uh, street children because they are victims and most of them are from uh, the, the, the soldiers, the, the families which are attacked by soldiers who were killed on the, the front line. And we need to work with these groups on the ground. So insecurity is very important in the Eastern Congo because this will affect the development and the change of the country. Uh, that's what I may say on what is going on now. Because without peace, we can't do anything, cannot mobilize. That's where we are working for the moment. Thank you. Absolutely. And I wish you and your organization uh, the absolute best. But Mar Maurice, would you like to add anything to that? Talk a little bit more about this rebel group, M23, and then maybe even touch on the role that, that U.S. Uh, imperialism is playing in this current conflict? Sure, sure. It's so good to have uh, the view uh, from Passy, uh, really from, from the ground up, you know, what he's facing, what are the young people are facing on a, on a daily uh, basis. And uh, trying to politically educate and mobilize the, the masses uh, for change uh, in the Congo. And all that uh, ought to be placed in the context of a 25-year war of aggression and plunder that's being waged against the Congolese people by proxies or allies of the United States. And I'm speaking specifically of the uh, government of Rwanda, led by Paul Kagame, who was recently in Washington, D.C., being feted by members of the Congressional Black Caucus and other politicians. Um, speaking of figures like Yari Museveni, uh, the leader of, uh, of Uganda. And uh, what has happened, uh, Brett, we, we talked about Lumumba uh, and the overthrow of Lumumba. We talked about the imposition of uh, Joseph Desiree Mobutu over the Congolese people uh, from 1965 to 1997. Uh, where the United States uh, installed and maintained the Mobutu uh, in power. Every time Congolese rose up to get rid of him, the U.S. would crush uh, the people, send in uh, forces or get its allies to go in and work with Mobutu to crush the resistance. And uh, by the time we got to the end of the Cold War uh, and Mobutu was no longer of use to the U.S., uh, they wanted to get rid of him. Uh, and at that time, uh, there were burgeoning pro-democracy movements uh, building up all over the continent. And the same happened in the Congo. They had what they called a national, uh, the Sovereign National Conference, uh, where the people were demanding change and overthrow of the dictatorship. So instead of the United States supporting that, the pro-democracy forces in the Congo, what they did was, uh, in the final analysis, was to back an invasion of the Congo uh, by their allies, Rwanda and Uganda in particular. They invaded in 1996, uh, installed a leader of their, their choice in 1996 in Lauren Kabila, 
And uh, Kabila wanted to shake himself loose from Rwanda and Uganda, which he did by reaching out to, uh, uh, by you got rid of uh, the Rwandan hold on them. And Rwanda and Uganda wanted to maintain control of the Congo. So they invaded again in 1998. And uh, Lauren Kabila reached out to Southern African Development Community, uh, Zimbabwe, Namibia, uh, Angola, to come to his rescue. And they were able to beat back uh, the U.S.-backed invasion by Rwanda and Uganda in 1998. Mm. And that 1998, uh, 1996 and 1998 invasions triggered what the United Nations says the deadliest conflict in the world since World War II, where an estimated 6 million Congolese perished as a result of, that, uh, of the conflict and conflict-related causes. Now, uh, uh, there was a treaty in 2002, a peace deal, but Rwanda and Uganda wanted to maintain control and access to the resources in the Congo. Ever since they invaded, if you look at, look at their, uh, their state books, uh, things like gold and, and timber for Uganda has skyrocketed in terms of exports coming out of Uganda. Uh, resources like coltan and tin uh, skyrocketed. Uh, in the, uh, if you look at the books at, uh, of Rwanda's books, Rwanda is now proclaimed as the leading producer of coltan in the world coltan that it gets out of the out of the Congo. So in order to maintain those interests, uh, both countries have sponsored militia groups in the Congo uh, from uh, since the end of uh, the, the treaty in 2002 right up to the present. Uh, M23 is basically the latest expression of Rwanda's, uh, in particular, Rwanda's uh, role in the Congo in utilizing militia group to destabilize the east of the Congo so that it can, can uh, exercise uh, control and retain access to the resources coming out of the, out of the east of the Congo. Mm. Uh, we've mobilized uh, when Obama was in, uh, uh, in the presidency. Friends of the Congo and others mobilized to put pressure on him uh, to withhold military aid from Rwanda uh, in an effort uh, to uh, staunch Rwanda's influence and role in destabilizing Eastern Congo. In fact, when Obama, President Obama, Barack Obama was a senator, he uh, crafted a bill that got passed into law, uh, Public Law 109456, uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo Relief, Security, and Democracy Promotion Act. And one section of that law said that the United States is authorized, uh, has authorized its Secretary of State to withhold aid to any uh, countries that destabilize the Congo. So we were saying to President Obama, this is your law. Mm. Your ally, Rwanda, is destabilizing the uh, east of Congo. Obama got on the phone, called uh, Kagame, told him to stay out of, out of, uh, out of the Congo, uh, published it as a readout, you know, as a signaling to people who were putting pressure on him, say, hey, this is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but that wasn't enough. And then he finally decided to withhold $200,000 in aid. This was about 2012 mm. uh, to the Rwandan military. Uh, that wasn't enough, of course, but what it did was it triggered other European nations to do the same, and they withheld tens of millions of aid to Rwanda, and that helped to squash the M23. But in 2021, Kagame revived uh, the, uh, his support for the M23, and they continue to destabilize the east of the Congo to this day. Uh, they're responsible for about a million people being displaced of the seven million that's been displaced in the in the Congo, and the uh, occupied territory is... Uh, as a uh, as a passage just shared, uh, Bunagana, one of the main um, areas that, that uh, M23 occupied, which they couldn't do without the backing of Rwanda. And Rwanda, it would have been impossible for Rwanda to do what it has done in the Congo for the past 25 years without the diplomatic, uh, without the United States and the United Kingdom running diplomatic interference, providing political cover for. Uh, the Paul Kagamis and the Yara Musevenis. Mm. Uh, so the U.S. is uh, part of the problem in that it has blocked justice, it has uh, prevented accountability, and for all intents and purposes, facilitated the impunity that we see in the region because of its support, continued support in terms of funding, in terms of ar arming, in terms of providing equipment, in terms of providing training, in terms of providing intelligence uh, to uh, Paul Kagame, Rwandan government, and certainly to Yeru Museveni uh, of, uh, of Uganda. So that's really the, the core of the conflict, the, the, the heart of the conflict 
uh, in the east of the Congo. And uh, even after the recent elections in, in December uh, with uh, President Cheskedi, who's been in power for five years, uh, saying that he's going to do something about what's happening in the east, but he hasn't, as Pasi has shared. Mm. And uh, that has uh, played into uh, that continued instability that we see in the, in the east of the Congo uh, to this very day. Yeah, I really thank you for that amazing breakdown of, of, of many years of, of history, the role the U.S. government has played in it all. Um, yeah, just, just fascinating and, and really tragic stuff, of course, in the eastern Congo. Right now they're dealing with killings, atrocities, displacement, dispossession, um, and, and all in an attempt to destabilize that entire region for ultimately the benefit of a small amount of people to have access to the profits that come from minerals in the area. Um, and that that really is an important aspect of all of this, you know. And and one of the main minerals that are is is constantly in the news is, is cobalt. And cobalt mining plays a really important role in the global economy, um, and also for this purported green capitalist transition in air quotes uh, that the West talks about incessantly. They need cobalt for those products. We use them in lithium batteries. We use them in our smartphones. We use them in electric vehicles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, mining this stuff is incredibly dangerous. Cobalt itself is toxic, and Congolese children, families, mothers, and, and more are the ones forced to toil in and around these mines for these uh, consumer goods um, and, and for these minerals. So can you please talk about uh, this situation in particular, the conditions that poor people in the Congo have to toil under in these mines, and how the rest of the world, especially the West, uh, benefits from what amounts to modern-day slavery? Yeah, thank you. You know, I'll be here as short as possible because this is a, a practical truth about uh, these minerals, not only cobalt, let's, it, let's talk about gold, uranium, and other minerals. I'm from the region called uh, Kamituga, where uranium is uh, shrouded in other minerals or cobalt are around there. There's so many minerals. But the point is that. We have two kinds of extraction of uh, these minerals. We have these handcraft, these local population, local people who extract mm -hmm. minerals from their local, I mean, local uh, tools. They have some spades, they use uh, lesser uh, hands, handcrafts. They don't have materials. And there is another kind of exploitation of these uh, minerals. Uh, we can see Chinese people and uh, let's say Canadians and other association organizations okay. exploiting gold, gold as far as uh, these uh, pro products, natural products are concerned. So the point is that I remember one day I was, I had an experience with Bandro Corporation because when you are extracting gold, you have uh, uh, what we call castorate salt and uh, you have a, a portion of cobalt copper and other products from when you are extracting gold, for example. And the point is that they bring all these material, raw materials, but the products are extracting abroad, not in Congo. They are taking raw materials, but the products are being uh, changed and transformed in, in the countries uh, which are supporting these multinational organizations. And this is the issue. And uh, I'm there to condemn condemn the uh, the, co the kind of contracts that our governments are signing secretly or let's say officially. So sometimes you can, you can hear them, uh, these politicians. Uh, let me attack directly our ongoing president, who is saying that we are attacking these atrocities, but we know that they make him sign some contracts. But when it comes to uh, uh, the media, he says something which is contrary, and is and claiming to claiming to uh, to to, uh, to condemn to blame his uh, Paul Kagame and all these groups uh, which are extracting these minerals. And these mining shafts are being uh, both which is supported by the governments and these foreign uh, foreign uh, forces. Let me uh, mention something about the neighboring countries. They have some contracts. I, I mentioned about. Uh, the collaboration between M23 and the government. Mm -hmm. They know how they collaborate. And the problem is they do not tell the truth to the population. They can't uh, lie to the population. 
And this is not the Lumumba's vision of the Congo. And the question is that if Lumumba was there, if he were there, what could he do? Lumumba, you know, experienced the same situation, but he was as courage as possible to denounce and to say no to that those kinds of exploitation. Remember someone uh, who was claiming to be the president of DRC, but inviting a Polkagan here in Chasa to come and uh, commemorate some a, a given national event. Someone who is who is being supported by the U.S. to export our minerals to to fund to fund these uh, these uh, rebel groups. Because it's worth mentioning that this rebel movement only focus on these mineral places where we can find minerals. They will never come here in Kinshasa because this western part of the country is not uh, mineral. Say is not uh, is not having these places don't have don't have the minerals. Mm. They always go there, and, and that's where you can see the conflict is being supported. And the point is that sometimes you can see. Uh, the kind of betrayal between our uh, army. And this is the point. Our army is made up, made up with people who are collaborating with these forces, these foreign, uh, foreign uh, institutions. Because the, the war that we are experiencing, which is based on materials, has got two aspects. Uh, sometimes they act directly by funding organizations, these corporations, these companies which exploit these minerals also they try to to fund these uh, rebels, so many armed groups. So that's the way they act. Sometimes they come softly and they also come hard. They, they work hard by using, supporting them with some materials, fighting materials with, like drones and, and just to control these materials, these devices which can control the places where the minerals are located. This is how they, they try to, uh, to to control. Because uh, our government is not able to have even a satellite. So we don't have the, uh, I mean the, uh, the, the scientific uh, device, I mean the scientific capacity to control the minerals. Even the country, we are not able to control by ourselves what is happening at which time and uh, where is the, I mean, the conflict taking place and who is controlling the Congolese state is not existing. And that's why you can see that we are not controlling the land. It is the problem of land because the soil is very rich and we are not able to control these places because we are corrupt. So this is the point about these minerals. So the kinds of culture that needs to be signed should be signed by people who are aware of the situation of the country and who are not corrupt because it is good. We, we have just been, uh, we have just elected and they, they were, they have power, they have five years to, five years to control the country and but should know how investors come in the country and what are the tangible actions. So truth about the, the situation. Agriculture and uh, industry, and let's say, and minerals uh, are two opposite uh, actions. When these organizations come and implant, okay, and, and implement their uh, offices in these places, they come with their materials, but they do not consider the needs of the local population, but the government is supporting their actions. Mm. That's what I can say in brief. So these organizations, whether they are signing official uh, I mean, agreements or secret agreements, they, they need okay, to be identified and we have to, uh, to impose our uh, sovereignty as far as the economy and the control of the minerals in the land is concerned. Thank you. Yeah, so really well said before I hand it off to Maurice, just uh, to reiterate some points. Absolutely great point about it's not just cobalt. Cobalt is one of the things that we often hear about in the, in the headlines, but there's gold, uranium, copper, and much more. It's just a very, it's an incredibly rich area in natural resources, as you're saying. And it's the land of the Congolese, but yet the Congolese don't have control and haven't had control of that land and of those riches and of those resources through these these factors of neocolonialism, imperialism, 
nationalism, um, funding these rebel groups, corporations, as you were mentioning, funding and arming rebels and armed groups to con- continue to keep Eastern Congo in this destabilized position so it's more easy uh, to exploit and take advantage of. And when you have corruption in government and you have um, collaborators in the army, it makes all of this much, much uh, more difficult. So I really appreciate that breakdown. It's incredibly important. Maurice, would you like to add anything uh, to any of that or or say anything at all about the situation? Yeah, yes, that's incredibly important. And that's one of our main organizing aims uh, uh, at Friends of the Congo. Uh, to work in concert with the Congolese so that they ultimately control and determine their own affairs, control their land, uh, control their resources, uh, control their, their country. Uh, all, everything that we do in terms of the raising awareness and engaging people, being on with you, Brett, is to channel people to that uh, very central and particular purpose. And imagine... Imagine if Congolese did control uh, the cobalt uh, in that they're producing. They produce 70% of the world's cobalt. If you add up all the countries in the world who produce cobalt, they don't equal what Congo uh, produces. Cobalt is a central, central ingredient in uh, rechargeable batteries, which is indispensable to the so-called green or clean energy uh, transition. You know, Gavin Newsom and his 2035 plan for California to go carbon uh, free by or combustion engine free by 2035. It it can't happen without cobalt coming out of the out of the Congo. Um, So uh, the Congo is a major player in uh, this sector. Uh, Unfortunately, as uh, Passy said, that. Uh, the Congolese people are not the primary beneficiaries, and they're not even the primary owners of uh, of the cobalt. Uh, and right now, what we see is, um, uh, and Kasi's right, around the cobalt, cobalt is really a byproduct of copper and nickel. It's not something that's produced by, uh, extracted by itself. Uh, and right now, what we see is this geostrategic battle unfolding for control of, uh, of uh, Congo's cobalt. Uh, where the United States trying to confront China, China has got its uh, its, uh, its Belt and uh, and Road uh, initiative uh, that it's uh, it's undertaking, and the United States, in response to China's Belt and Road initiative, uh, has initiated uh, what they call the PGII. That's the the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment. And one of the signal features of the Partnership for Global and Infrastructure Investment is the Lobito uh, Rail Corridor. That is a rail line that has been uh, established from Kolwezi, the heart of the, the cobalt capital of the world, right out through to the Lobito port in Angola that enables critical minerals uh, that are vital to U.S. industries to get out of the Congo uh, more efficiently uh, with uh, uh, less cost and uh, less time as opposed to minerals being shipped out through South Africa or through Tanzania. Uh, Just uh, last uh, week, the uh, company that is uh, taking the lead in concert with the United States, uh, Ivanhoe Mines, is uh, the CEO, CEO, uh, Robert Freeland, was on talking about how this is going to help propel Congo from a third uh, produce, leading producer of copper in the world to ultimately to, to number one. Uh, and all this is taking place really above with, how can I say, uh, above the level of the Congolese people. Mm. Like they're not benefiting from this. Right. The, the comprador class, of course, uh, who, whose class interests are more in alignment with uh, foreign capital and uh, the global elites than they are with the uh, with the local Congolese people. That's why we saw it just uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, Congolese were demonstrating around uh, the occupation of their land in the east of the country. They were arrested by by the government. 
uh, which which makes sense because the the interests are not aligned. They're not their interests aren't with the Congolese people. But the point is that there's a global game that's unfolding, and, and instead of the Congolese people being part of it and benefiting uh, to uh, to whatever extent it could, uh, they're victims of it. You know, children who are in the mines who are being killed. Uh, we had a delegation that was traveling on the road from Kowesi, the mining capital, to Lubumbashi in, uh, just a few, day, a few days ago. And uh, they had to go, they were going through a uh, demonstration that was being led by diggers against one of the major mines in the Congo, the Tenki Fugurume. And the security forces and the presidential guard were called in to crush uh, the average worker that was organizing uh, to try and exist, really. Uh, but uh, in uh, coming up against the uh, the corporate forces, uh, they were the security forces of the of the Congolese government came in and and fired on them and, and killed a number of them and injured many others. So uh, that's uh, the uh, the challenge that we see Congolese facing as the whole world uh, is looking to move from the combustion engine uh, to electric vehicles and. Uh, really, I want to take this moment to make an appeal to progressive forces, to labor unions, to climate justice advocates. We saw how they rallied in the United States around the workers uh, at the top of the, what they call it, the EV supply chain, where the United Auto Workers uh, collaborated with uh, 350.org and the Sierra Club and others to protect the interests of the worker in the wake of the passing of the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, what some of them claim to be the largest climate bill in the world. I don't know if that's the case, but in any, in any case, they, they rallied around, around the, uh, the workers uh, with the UAW uh, to protect those workers at the top of the supply chain. What we're trying to share and let the world know is like there is no top of the supply chain, EV supply chain, without a bottom. And at the bottom of the EV supply chain, the children are catching hell. The women are catching hell. Uh, the local population are catching hell. They're suffering from what we call the three Ds. Uh, death, as I shared with you, uh, the how security forces fire on workers and kill them. Uh, Patsy talked earlier about the hand digging up, hand, using hands to dig for minerals. They call it artisanal and small-scale mining, where they dig deep into the ground and sometimes they're cave-ins and injuries. So you have the death that's taking place among local population. And then there is uh, destruction, destruction of the environment. Uh, the, the dust that comes from the mining of uh, the industrial mines that go into the air and land on the, on the plants and uh, kill the plants so people can't uh, farm or land in the water and kill the fish in the water, pollute the water so there's no potable water. People cannot get food from fish, uh, fish in the water and, and feed themselves. So the destruction of water ways get polluted and the destruction of the uh, the environment. And then there's displacement. Wherever you see a mine, there used to be a, per a village, people living there. But they're displaced uh, in order to facilitate uh, the uh, the extraction of those resources. And they're not compensated. They're promised health care. They're promised education. They are promised housing. And they get either none of it or very little of it. So these three Ds, the, the death, the destruction, and the displacement, is what or what uh, the people at the bottom of the supply chain are reaping. Uh, therefore, it's incumbent upon us who are advocating for those at the top of the supply chain to also include those who are at the bottom of the supply chain. Uh, and that's uh, very critical when it comes to the Congo, uh, when we're talking about, quote unquote, a uh, green energy transition. Because even Congo is like really two sides of one coin. You talk about the green energy transition and... Uh, Critical part of that is the combating the climate crisis. Congo is a part of the second largest rainforest in the world, which is vital in combating the climate crisis. Congo Basin sequesters more carbon than all the tropical rainforests combined. And Congo is home to the largest tropical peatland the size of England, a, a literal uh, a virtual uh, carbon, carp, uh, carbon bomb that, if it's not protected, uh, could release up to 20 years of uh, U.S. worth of uh, a pollution into the atmosphere. So when it comes to combating the climate crisis, facilitating the, the green or so-called clean energy transition, Congo is front and center, looms large, but uh, the, the activists 
the policy makers, the decision makers, do not take Congo into consideration, especially those who are at the bottom of the supply chain, whose voices we must uplift, whose interests we must fight for, uh, uh, as a really as a means for getting to the heart of the matter, which is what where we want to see Congolese control and determine the affairs of the Congo. Yeah, I mean, incredibly moving and so important. And I hope that's one of the main lessons people take away from from this episode and and other episodes that we've done is that in order to fight climate change, which all human beings on Earth have a vested interest in in combating the destabilization of our climate system on Earth, we have to tie that with the struggles against capitalism and colonialism. Because liberals will tell you this pretty story about how we're transitioning away from fossil fuels into green technology, but their entire ideology is premised on hiding the deep suffering of the people, as Marie said, at the bottom of that chain that make the entire thing possible. And I do not want a solution to climate change that comes with the brutalization of innocent men, women, and children anywhere on the earth, including and especially in the Congo. And so when we talk about climate change, we should also talk about the Congo. When we talk about a transition, we should talk about the bottom of that of that um, that supply line and how the labor at the point of extraction needs to be treated with dignity and fairness and deep global international protection um, so that they can have a dignified life. Um, and that they can have the justice that they deserve and control over their own labor and control over their own lives, or else we are building a climate transition on the bodies and on the, the bones of human beings. And that is just going to continue and perpetuate the deep injustices that have racked this world for centuries. Um, and so I really, really applaud both of you, um, Passy, for your on the ground work, um, fighting with the masses, doing political education, trying to organize for your people. Um, you're you're a genuine hero, and I deeply appreciate you, Maurice, for coming on and sharing your your deep well of knowledge with us on this subject as well. Before we let you go, can you please let us know um, what we in the West, if anything, can do to help our brothers and sisters in the Congo, and what resources or other recommendations you would offer to anyone listening who might want to learn more about this issue and help in whatever ways they can. Definitely, definitely. Thank you, and I need to get the recording of that last piece that you just uh, stated. <laughs> And play it on on loop for sure because you're just so on point. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we encourage people to to support this movement uh, around the Congo, the Solidarity Movement. Go to Free Congo, FreeCongo.org. We encourage people to go to FreeCongo.org. Uh, when they go there, there'll be three things that they'll be able to do. They could donate. Uh, they could uh, sign a sign a petition uh, where there's a lawsuit that's being brought against uh, major tech companies uh, that we're pressuring the companies to. To settle the suit, uh, it's, in, it's brought on behalf of 14 Congolese uh, children and their and their families. Uh, we're also press, uh, pressuring the Biden administration not to to lift the none of that. Not that we're supportive of sanctions, but not to lift the sanctions that's been posed on uh, Dan Gertler, mm. an Israeli uh, business tycoon uh, who's made billions off uh, the Congo and repatriated that money to to Israel to support uh, settler colonialism uh, in uh, in Israel. Uh, so we're calling on the Biden administration not to lift the sanctions that's been imposed on currently by uh, the Treasury Department. Mm. Uh, we're calling on the Biden administration to, at the very least, do what Obama did, withhold military aid from Rwanda. So Rwanda does not uh, continue to destabilize the Congo. So you'll have the option to take action in those uh, those three um, policy areas. And then finally, for people to, to fill out a form if they want to join the movement, get more involved, uh, go and connect with Pastney on the ground, one of our delegations. Uh, support the uh, the organizations that we're supporting on the front lines in the cities like Passy's organization, work with street children, indigenous leaders who are in the uh, in the Congo uh, basin rainforest, uh, leaders who are on the front lines of the conflict in the east, and certainly those who are in the mining areas. So, freecongo.org, they can donate, uh, they can uh, advocate, and they can join the movement. Freecongo.org, that is the where we encourage people to go to be a part of this effort. Beautiful. And I'll make sure to link to that in the show notes so people can easily find it and go help. And right after we end this conversation, I'm going to go donate and I'm going to go sign myself. And I encourage anybody listening to do the same. Um, Passy, before we let you go, is there any last words that, that you would want to, to say or anything that you'd want to plug or recommend before we before we end? Yeah. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your interest in Congo. I say thank you to Strand of the Congo. Thank you to Brother Morris for the kind of support uh, 
and we are having from them. We need more uh, more funds for uh, making Rumumba be known. So last last month on the 17th, we tried to mobilize around 200 young Congolese, even a uh, old Congolese people uh, about Lumumba. We need more funds to make the millions of Congolese to know Lumumba. And this needs requires more administration. We need to make these vulnerable, vulnerable uh, population groups of people like street children who are abandoned, yeah, abandoned by their families. And most of them are coming from these, uh, these families whose fathers dead on the front line. Mm. He died on the, uh, I mean, the war in the Eastern Congo. So we need to mobilize, working with more schools, we need to mobilize thousands of Congolese to understand who Mumba was and what is the real vision of Mumba. We are working on the translation of his speeches. And I say thank you for this time. Thank you for the struggle. More details uh, with artists. We are working with artists on the ground, and it's not easy to record songs, to make some videos. We need materials. We need also administration support to make uh, our... Why not coming up with more centers, cultural centers in all provinces? Uh, those are the kind of support that we are having. We said thank you for the fans of the Congo. Thank you for this opportunity, and thank you for uh, future events. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for, for all your wonderful work. We send our love and our solidarity um, to you and the Congolese people and their struggle for self-determination and control over their own land and resources. And Rev Left, although we're not a huge outlet here in the West, we're here um, anytime. If you ever want to come back on, update us about the situation or get more information out, you have my email. Please don't hesitate to reach out. So thank you both so much. And I look forward to speaking with you again in the future. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Eric.